Chapter 9 1. I would happily have stayed another day or two in Adelaide, but I had trucks to make. I w it was almost time to meet my friends in Melbourne, but first I had a promise to myself of long standing to visit the Mornington Peninsula, a coastal area of beauty and charm just south of Melbourne. As ever in Australia, it would take some getting to. I felt Adelaide. I left Adelaide early and was dismayed to discover within an hour or so of setting off that I was facing yet another long day of driving on empty roads through a featureless expanse. This seemed particularly unfair because, in the first place, I had supposed that I was heading back to, into civilization, and second, I had had quite enough of this sort of thing already, and third, I had intentionally chosen a slightly longer route along a coastal highway to avoid the prospect of visual overland tedium. The road I was on was called the Prince's Highway. The map showed it running in a graceful arc along the edge of a vast bay identified as the Young Husband, Young Husband Peninsula. And indeed it did present hours of sunny coastal views, but the tide was miles out leaving the sea as a distant thread of bright blue on the far side of a million painfully reflective acres of salt, paint, salt pans. The inland side presented an equally featureless blankness filled with a single infinitely repeated species of low, bush, low shrub. For 146 kilometers, the road was perfectly empty. To pass the time, I sang Australia's unofficial national anthem, Waltzing Matilda. It is an interesting song. It was written by Banjo Patterson, who was not only Australia's greatest poet of the 19th century, but also the only one named for a stringed instrument. It goes, and I think the record should show that these are the words precisely as set down by Patterson. Oh, there once was a swagman camped in the billabong under the shade of a kuliba tree and he sang as he looked at his old billy boiling who come a swaltzing matilda's with matilda with me the main dis distinguishing feature of waltzing matilda you will notice is that it makes no sense obviously it makes no sense to anyone not familiar with bush lingo that that part was intentional but even when you understand the words, it makes no sense. A billy bond, for instance, is a waterfall hole. So a question that immediately arises before you have even concluded the first line is why was the swagman camped in it? I would camp beside it myself. You see what you are up against. The only possible conclusion is that Patterson had a few when he grabbed his ink pot and dashed off the words. Anyway, just to keep you fully informed, a swagman in Australian parlance is an itinerant traveler. The term comes from the rolled blanket or swag he carried. Another name for a swag was a Matilda, evidently from the German Mathilde. Don't ask me, my interest in this goes only so far. A billy is a can for boiling water and kuliba tree is a kuliba tree. There, 
there you have the terms why the swagman is uh, waltzing with his bedroll and why above all he desires someone or something in the second verse it's a ship for goodness sake to join him in his bizarre and possibly depraved activity are of course questions that cannot be answered on the other hand it has a lovely tune it's borrowed from an old scottish air though bonnie wood craigilia which i render particularly melodically if i say so myself especially with my head out the window to achieve that warby wobbly effect that comes from singing into an onrush of air up speed the problem with knowing only one verse of course is that it gets a trifle repetitive after a time so you may conceive my satisfaction when i realized that if you changed billy boiling to willy boiling and i should perhaps just note that a willy in anglo australian argot is the part of a gentleman's anatomy that he would be least likely to place in a boiling medium. It put an entirety and it put an entirely new slant on things, and I was able to come up with approximately 47 new stanzas, which not only extend the song to a length suitable for a long bus journeys, but brings to it a dimension of coherence that it has lacked for almost a century. I might have gotten the verse totally, the verse, the verse total even higher except that I, as I rounded the last sweep of bay and followed the road inland through a stretch of scrub, I came upon a sign announcing the big lobster and in the excitement I abandoned my musical interests. The big lobster, you see, was something, or more properly, a species of something that I had longed to see ever since I had hit the road. One of the more cherishable peculiarities of Australians is that they like to build big things in the shape of other things. <clears throat> Give them a bale of chicken wire, some fiberglass, and a couple of pots of paint, and they will make you, say, an enormous pineapple or strawberry or, as here, a lobster. Then they put the cafe and the gift shop inside, erect a big sign inside the highway, beside the highway for the benefit of people whose acuity does not evidently extend to spotting a 50 foot high piece of fruit standing beside an otherwise empty highway then sit back and wait for money to roll in some 60 of these objects are scattered across the australian landscape like leftover props from a 1950s horror movie. You can, if you have sufficient gas money and nothing approaching a real life, visit a big prawn, a big koala, a big oyster with such lights for eyes apparently, a big lawn mower, a big marlin, a big orange, and a big merino ram among many others. The process, I am patriotically proud to tell you, was started by an American named Landy who built a big banana at Coffs Harbor on the New South Wales coast, which proved so magically attractive to passing vehicles that it made Mr. Landy, as it were, the big banana of the business. Generally, these objects are cannily set along a stretch of highway so astoundingly void and dull that 
you will stop for almost anything as of course I did now when the road bent once and once again and I found looming before me a monstrously large <clears throat> reddish pink commendably lifelike lobster reeling up beside the road as if about to dine on a morsel of passing traffic. Owing to the peculiar shape of a lobster, the owners had decided, I imagine after quite a lot of thought, not to try to accommodate a gift shop and cafe inside. So the big lobster sat on the front lawn, secured with guy wires while the real retail facilities were in a separate building behind. I got out and approached for a closer look. It was impressive, impressively outsized. I learned from subsequent inquiry that it is 56 feet from the ground to the tip of its feelers, a good size even in the ambitious world of giant objects. I was looking at it from various angles when I realized that I had wandered into someone's photograph. Oh, sorry, I called. No worries, mate, he replied with an easy-going air. You helped to give it scale. He came up and stood beside me. He was in his early thirties and looked vaguely sad and dorky, like someone who worked in a low-grade job and still lived at home. He was dressed as if for a vacation in shorts and a t-shirt and that said Noosa in large letters. Noosa is a Queensland resort. Together we stood for quite a period, silently admired the lobster. Big, isn't it? I remarked at last, for very little escapes me in the world of fiberglass crustaceans. You wouldn't get the snap of me in front of it, would you? He said in that curiously circular way in which Australians beg a favor. Of course. He went and stood beside it, a hand perched affectionately on the foreleg. You can tell people it's an engagement photo, I suggested. He liked that idea. Yeah, he said keenly. Meet the fiance. She's not much for looks or converse conversation, but geez, can she scuttle. I decided I liked this guy. So, do you visit these things a lot? I said, handing him back the camera. Only if I'm passing, you know. It's a pretty good one, though. Better than the big koala at Moiston. I didn't feel there was a great deal I could say to this. At Wild Chop, there's a big bull, he added. I raised my eyebrows in a way that said, oh yes? He nodded fondly. Its tentacles swing in the breeze. It has tentacles? I said, impressed. I'll say, if they fell on you, you wouldn't get up in a hurry. We took an extended moment to savor this image. It would make an interesting insurance claim, I suppose, I observed at last. Yeah, he liked this idea too. Or a newspaper headline, Man Crushed by Falling Bollocks. By Falling Buttocks Bollocks, I offered. Yeah, we were getting on like a house on fire. I hadn't had a conversation this long in days. What am I saying? I hadn't had this much fun in days. Unfortunately, neither of us could think of anything more to say, and so we just stood awkwardly for a while. Well, nice meeting you, he said at last, and with a shy smile shuffled off. Nice meeting you, I said and meant it. I went inside and bought a fridge magnet and about 15 big lobster postcards and returned to the road in a mellow frame of mind. I headed the car towards, 
what Wild Nambul and the famous Great Ocean Road and drove some minutes in thoughtful silence. Then abruptly I thrust my head out the window and in a sweet but robust voice sang, forgetting that forgetting that spoons stir hot liquids much better. The swagman immersed his tool in his tea, and he sighed as he spied his old, old willy boiling. Now I can't bugger you, so will you bugger me?